This is America's Great Southwest, a vast landscape with a long history of peoples who've inhabited its canyons and plateaus. Thousands of years ago, a civilization flourished here and left ruins that are as grand and mysterious as anything that exists in North America. Great settlements, imposing cliff dwellings and ceremonial chambers called kivos, all are attributed to the ancient Anasazi. There are people today who believe Anasazi spirits still inhabit these great badlands. And a century ago, a gruesome discovery was made in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. Fourteen skeletons were found in a mass grave. They might have been murdered, or they might have been the victims of human sacrifice. Their fate was sealed in the American West centuries prior to the arrival of any of its familiar peoples, before even the Navajo or Hopi tribes of Native Americans, at the dawn of civilization. Today, many of us live in cities that we take for granted. An urban way of life, rational, practical, bustling. It's not easy for us to grasp a very different view of the world, in which there are spiritual cities inhabited by ancestors recalled in the traditions of storytelling among Native Americans which fuse myth and reality. The stories may be of imaginary scenes, or they might lead us to forgotten places that did once exist. This is the Four Corners region of the American Southwest, which has been called that by white Americans because four states meet here, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. But to the native people, this is the land of the Anasazi, the ancient ones. They're long gone, but it's said their spirits are still a powerful presence here. In the autumn of 1897, a rancher named Richard Wetherill was lured deep into this remote and barren land by a story about the Anasazi. His fascination with the Ancient Ones had begun ten years before and hundreds of miles away. Looking for cattle which had strayed from a grazing herd, he'd made a staggering find. The ancient cliff dwellings at Mache Verde in Colorado. These spectacular buildings and the artifacts found here were tangible evidence of a highly accomplished civilization which had simply disappeared. Later, Wetherill found similar sites in Utah and Arizona. But all these places were, so the legend said, dwarfed by something far more spectacular. Wetherill was now looking for a fabled city, older, bigger and richer than anything found so far. He had no maps, no specific directions, just the stories and a Navajo guide he hoped he could trust. The deeper they travelled into the desert, the more challenging their quest became. It seemed quite impossible that these parched badlands could sustain a great city, but Wetherill persevered. 
On an autumn afternoon in October 1897, he and his guide discovered a deep canyon, and there was the lost city of the legends. It was a fantastic find. Wetherill was astonished by what he saw. Buildings quite unlike any he'd seen before and never imagined he might discover here. Freestanding buildings, some as tall as five stories. One building alone, which became known as Pueblo Bonito, contained more than 650 rooms. Two hundred yards wide, but 15 miles long, Chaco Canyon is the site of a dozen massive complexes. They include over 300 enormous, perfectly round pits, the purpose of which could only be guessed at. The walls were covered with wonderful paintings, carvings, signs and symbols. What they meant to the people who created them was unknown. Nothing found in all of North America has rivaled the amazing Chaco Canyon. Wetherill and the archaeologists who followed him were astounded and entranced by the pottery they found, the weapons, tools, jewellery, artefacts of every kind. They're abundant and each is a work of art. The Chacoan people clearly created one of the great cultures of the ancient Americas. They had a diverse society, many specializations such as pottery and basket weaving, ritual specialists. We already know enough about these people to know that one of the special things about the Chacoan phenomenon is that they created a brilliant civilization of art and all the things that go with it. The Anasazi were fascinated by the heavens. They were sophisticated watchers of the sky. Many believe these thousand-year-old markings record a spectacular astronomical event, a supernova. A supernova is an exploding star way out in the galaxy. But for a month or two, that single star can outshine the other 200 billion stars of the galaxy. And there's evidence from Chinese and Japanese records that on July 4th, 1054, a spectacular new star appeared. The crescent moon indicates the supernova's position in the sky. The handprint marks this as a sacred site. Clearly, it was a place of religious and ritual importance, and there was evidence of what that might be. For Wetherill made a grisly and disturbing discovery. In a small room, he uncovered a mass grave containing 14 skeletons. Each was covered with exquisite turquoise jewelry. One of the figures was draped with more than 4,000 pieces of the semi-precious stone. He was almost certainly a man of high-ranking status. The other 13 were women, and the evidence clearly shows they did not die natural deaths. Wetherill's wife, Marietta, who visited the site, speculated about these deaths and their meaning. The skeletons of 13 women were lying against the wall, clear around the room, and every one had a hole in their skulls. They were his wives, perhaps, to go to the afterlife with him. The Diary of Marietta Wetherill, 1897. There are other burial sites in Chaco Canyon, but none like this one. An even larger question baffled Wetherill. Twenty million years ago, Chaco Canyon lay beneath the great inland sea. But when the water receded, only a dry and parched desert remained. Mesopotamia, Egypt, a number of others, uh, China, 
All of those are, are complex societies founded in a very arid region. But the key to those places is they have major river systems. We just don't have the water here. Water is critical. With no apparent substantial water supply, this civilization had apparently flourished. This appeared to be an impossible place to build a city, and not just because of the lack of water. The canyon walls provided the stone for the buildings, but there were a great many timbers used too. Archaeologists estimate the construction required wood from a quarter of a million trees, yet today the landscape is totally barren. Samples taken from the beams indicate that the trees were not local. Many came from as far as 50 miles away. There, stone axes were used to cut and trim them. The Chaco people didn't have horses or oxen or carts with wheels, so here was another puzzle. They must have had some means of transporting timber long distances. Archaeologists have calculated that the Anasazi were here from about 900 to 1250 AD. At the same time, other monuments were being built around the world. Spiraling Muslim minarets were being erected in Asia. The French completed the great Romanesque monastery at Cluny. And the magnificent Russian cathedral of St. Sophia in Novgorod was consecrated. All who visited Chaco Canyon, Wetheril, the modern discoverer, and those who followed, have been greatly moved by the ruins of the civilization that lived here. And many have sensed it's a place haunted by those who must have been forced to abandon it because a calamity of some kind had overwhelmed them. A clue to what that disaster was is to be found in a secret ceremony of the Native Americans, which they've only once revealed to a photographer. A ceremony in which they dance with venomous snakes. magical powers. In 1925, a photographer was allowed into a Hopi Indian settlement in northern Arizona. It was a rare opportunity to capture something never filmed before or since, a ritual perhaps little changed in thousands of years. The dancers carry venomous snakes which could easily twist and strike with deadly effect. Dancing with the snakes in their mouths affirms, say the Hopi, their oneness with nature and the earth. A line of dancers represents antelope, whose galloping feet produce a sound like thunder when heard racing across the landscape. But the clouds must be induced to release their rain. Because snakes spend their lives so close to the earth, they and they alone have the power to draw down the rain. Rain is the key that unlocks one of Chaco's greatest mysteries. The Anasazi were a wandering people, nomads who lived off the land. Then, a thousand years ago, they stopped wandering and were able to start building here in this parched and barren place. The puzzle of how they achieved this was solved by a new scientific technique, dendrochronology, the study of the tree rings in the timber used to construct the buildings at Chaco. They provided a startling revelation. About a thousand years ago, the weather changed. An era of record rains began. That wet period in the 900s allowed things to happen for these folks. 
And it could have been, given the psyche of human populations, maybe it was wet enough, and maybe for the first time they sur saw p surpluses that they could never had never imagined before. Until this moment in their history, the Anasazi had depended on hunting and the gathering of whatever wild plants they could find. Now they could be farmers, they could grow corn, squash, beans, a dependable and abundant food supply. The ancient people of Chaco Canyon began to build an irrigation system to capture and control a water supply. Their tools were primitive, but they built monumentally. That they were able to do so with brute force is astonishing, and there's a belief that they were aided by superhuman powers. One of the things that my grandma used to tell me in accomplishing major tasks is that a community has to be whole. Everything was done for the betterment of the community. They put their heart and soul in, into these projects. I feel that there was a lot of the spirits and the guidance from a higher being. There was such a high level of spirituality in Chaco at the time. It's really not um, difficult for me to, to believe that uh, a lot of that had, had to do with the preciseness of these structures and their concept of uh, time frame. That if it took a year to build a structure, then that's what it took. The Anasazi left no written records, only the haunted ruins, cryptic imagery, and tales told by the old to the young. No more than relics and rumors. It was an old legend about a magnificent city that had brought Wetheril here in the first place. And it was another that led archaeologists to an astounding discovery. It was said that the Ancient Ones had an immense road system. Archaeologists found nothing more than short, narrow paths. It looked like a story exaggerated in the telling. Then, scientists began to use sophisticated new techniques of aerial observation to see beneath the surface of the landscape. A vast network of roads long obscured by sand and silt suddenly appeared. We know that the canyon itself was the heart of a world that stretched out towards the four quarters with long straight ceremonial roadways that run out to so-called Chaco outliers, 30 or 40 miles away in many cases. These roads were very wide, some 40 feet across, as broad as a modern city street. Some were carved into the sheer vertical cliffs of the canyon. As excavations proceeded, archaeologists began to wonder what kind of a city this was. For the number of buildings, there appeared to be very few people buried here. Only about 700 skeletons have been discovered, most of them inside the smaller houses. And the archaeologists were surprised that there weren't very many burials in comparison with excavating small house sites that are basically domestic habitations. And they said, wow, there's something, there's something really strange. And they didn't key into the fact that, of course, it's strange. These are public buildings. If we were to excavate a library or a post office or a courthouse in our society, we wouldn't find very many human remains. Other clues to the mystery of these buildings may lay buried just outside the canyon. Covering just two acres, Pueblo Alto is smaller than Pueblo Benito, 
but it's yielded new insight into the real purpose of the so-called great houses. As so often happens at archaeological sites, the rubbish heap proved to be a valuable record. Covering close to a quarter of an acre, it represents a hundred years' worth of refuse. More than 200,000 pieces of pottery have been found in the mound. Smaller shards indicate that there may have once been as many as a million pottery pieces. The vast number of pots far exceeds the needs of the estimated population. A clue to why this might be was suggested by the fact that the layers of rubbish vary in depth at different eras. There's probably some kind of ritual thing happening there at Chaco where people come together maybe once a year or something like that. They have ceremonies or some kind of event there and then the, the stuff they bring with them they, they throw away or leave there, maybe intentionally broken and left in the trash midden. We may never know what really took place here, but many scholars believe that it was a spiritual center where worship and ritual were the dominant activities. For the Anasazi, religion and nature were inextricably intertwined. The earth and the sky were held in reverence. The sun itself is important. We call it father. We call the moon father as well. We call earth mother. And they're like the parents of the people that occupy Chaco Canyon. When people move around a lot, as these people originally did, and our nomads, they look at the nighttime sky, it's the one consistent element of their world as they move. But when people settle down, as these people did, now you can watch the daytime sky and you understand very quickly that cycle of the sun, which creates for you a yearly arena in which to play out your life. So that you can predict when to plant, you can predict when the light is going to almost leave the world and when it's going to return so that you know everything is unfolding as it's supposed to. Of the many images at Chaco, none appears more frequently than the spiral. Some are tightly coiled, others are loosely drawn, but all seem to be essential elements of a profound system giving spiritual meaning to the physical world. The spiral etched into the magnificent Fahara Butte is part of an ingenious mechanism for tracking the movement of the sun. It's placed between three enormous stone slabs. Every year at the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the shaft of light begins to crawl across the spiral at sunrise. Then, around noon, it happens. A streak, known as the Sun Dagger, slices directly through the middle of the spiral. A central event of Anasazi life, the full ascendancy of their father sun, has been marked. The calendar is secure. The cycle of life will prevail. Mother Earth will continue to produce. These were common beliefs among pagan sun worshippers of the past, but each culture had its own ceremonies and rituals and ways of appeasing the wrath of their gods. Uninitiated, many of the structures here look forbidding, and none more so than the underground chambers called kivas, which appear vast and threatening. But for those who worshipped here, it was a place to communicate with the sky. In Anasazi architecture, at Chaco Canyon, for example, many of the great kivas particularly reflect their knowledge of astronomy. And we think the circular shape reflects the view of the heavens is almost the bowl of the night sky. 
We also think that certain windows existed to let the sunlight in in the mornings and in the evenings and shine on the wall and produce a kind of a dance or pattern that they can interpret and monitor the annual cycle. Of all the kivas, the one called Casa Rinconada is the largest and most elaborate. It's also the most intact. The roofs and upper structures of most kivas have long since collapsed. At Casa Rinconada, it's still possible to experience the dance of the sun once a year. Here, at sunrise on that longest day, June the 21st, a magical moment occurs. It's an event that's been played out on these stones for nearly a thousand years. The dawn light pierces the kiva through a small window at the top casting a golden rectangle on the wall opposite. Slowly, the shaft of light crawls along the stony face to illuminate one niche that receives no light at any other time of the year. You can imagine the darkened interior of this enclosed underground kiva, like a great silo, and the priests and other people waiting in the darkness for the dawn and the light of the midsummer sun shining through the window and illumining a niche that probably contains some image I think we'll never know what it was. The Kiva is a place of living wonder to many people. For park ranger G.B. Cornucopia, this is the essence of the spirit of Chaco. You feel like you're hearing the echoes of something that's real important and that connects you in to an event that you have felt insulated from previous to that. That you feel like it's something that you know about conceptually, but suddenly now your whole body and everything is a part of it and you see it, you feel it, you hear it, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience. For 250 years, a civilization flourished here but the people were dependent on what they regarded as the benevolence of their gods, who gave the rainfall they needed to survive. 1150 to 1170, very, very bad drought. And it looks like, because I would say there's a major depopulation of Chaco Canyon. Each one of those successively seems to be one of the worst they'd seen you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years. The great era of rain, which had made possible the building of Chaco, gradually abated, and then gave way to a relentless drought. For the people who lived here, the disappearance of the rain had a religious message. If you anger the gods or the spirits that hold the rain, then they would just withdraw that privilege we're told that if we go into a ceremony, if we go into an activity without our whole mind, body, and soul, then our prayers might not be answered. There was constant need to placate the gods. Rituals passed down from time immemorial captured in this rare film suggest what may have happened. During this Hopi rain ceremony, the clans gather to compete in sacred games, much as the ancient Greeks held Olympics to honor their gods. <laughs> Members of the snake and antelope clans raced barefoot across the desert and up the mesa. When they'd finished the grueling race, the winner was rewarded for his struggle with a jar of water. It began as a holy rite, but as the years passed, the people of Chaco perhaps developed too great a pride in winning. If so, they might have lost regard for their spirit world. It's almost impossible for the mass to make that connection. But if one individual within that mass can make that connection, 
then because of that one individual, nobody knows who that individual is. But if one individual can make that true connection, then the spirits that reward uh, such efforts will reward the Pueblo with, with, with rain. It's possible that conflict arose because a ruler or priest criticized the people, and he might be the one whose grave was found along with 13 murdered women. They might have been sacrificed to appease the gods, or they might have died violently when the social order collapsed as the drought continued. They might have been murdered. We know that some of the, um, the, the burials in the great houses, some of the people appear to have been killed whether ritually or otherwise, they, they have, they have, their skulls are, are smashed and they have broken, broken legs. The precise sequence of events is lost, but it is certain that the rains failed, the crops withered, and slowly over time, the people left Chaco Canyon. It could no longer sustain them. The Anasazi, the ancient ones, were forced to leave this great city. But this was not the end of their story. To many Native Americans who live near Chaco Canyon, these images, called anthropomorphs, record the origins of the ancient ones, the Anasazi. But what do they actually symbolize? I've had Pueblo peoples tell me that uh, when they see the anthropomorphs, for instance, they'll occasionally say, well, that's when we had tails. Uh, that's when we lived in the earlier worlds, and we were of a different form then. There are those who believe that the demise of Chaco was inevitable, that the city was just a stop on a long historical journey which their gods had mapped out for them, and that Chaco was not meant to last forever. Once they got up on top, they started migrating in the southerly direction, and Chaco Canyon was about one of the stops in this migration route. We are in a journey. We've been on a journey since our ancestors came up through, through the underworld. Our journey isn't built on just a hundred years or a thousand years. There's, there's no time frame. I don't know where the journey is gonna end. The Chaco people did not vanish. It's now generally agreed that the Hopi, the Zia, the Zuni, and the other Pueblo people are their direct descendants. The Navajo may not be. They seem to have arrived in the area long after the Anasazi left. But Anasazi is a Navajo word, and some scholars now regret having taken it up. It's kind of a dirty word. Uh, the, the Hopi and other Pueblo people really hate it, but it's the word that the uh, anthropologists have latched onto. It means something like the, our enemy ancestors or the enemies of our ancestors. Four hundred years after the original inhabitants left Chaco, and well after the arrival of new tribes like the Navajo, an unfamiliar race of people arrived. These were the pale faces, sporting beards, astride horses that were unknown in America. And these interlopers turned out to be a much greater threat than any of the dangers that had been faced before. The first Europeans appeared in 1540, drawn to the area by a legend of seven fabulous cities filled with gold. It might have been Chaco Canyon they'd heard of, in which case its fame was responsible in part for the downfall of the tribes. Along with their desire to plunder the riches of a new world was a mission to convert all pagans to Christianity by persuasion or, if necessary, by force.
Native American holy men were tortured and killed. Ritual objects were destroyed. Native Americans were enslaved to build missions and do other work for the white man. Most damaging of all were the diseases the Europeans brought with them, to which the Native Americans had no immunity. Epidemics of viral illnesses such as smallpox devastated the defenseless peoples, and a series of plagues almost wiped them out. There were uprisings against the Europeans, but they all failed. The great migration of the Anasazi from north to south was stopped. A new and for the Native Americans devastating concept brought by the Europeans was the idea that the land could be owned by individuals. This was just one of many new values imposed upon Native American life. The people were ruthlessly suppressed. Their own language was outlawed and they were forced to cut their hair short. It seemed as though the old ways would be lost. Ties would be broken with the ancient ones. But there was Native American resistance, which took the form of rituals acted out in secret and the telling of their own legends. And so it was that Chaco Canyon came to be for Native Americans a secret place where the spirits of their ancestors lived on and could only be reached by those with special powers. The pace of European life has long been governed by the mechanics of the clock and a more venerable way of timekeeping by the sun and the stars has been forgotten in the modern world. For some people, there's a sense that timekeeping in hours and minutes distances them from more natural rhythms of life and a spirit world like that of Native Americans. If you're going to go hunting, you have hunting spirits. If you, you're, you're dancing for rain, you have spirits uh, that assist you in, in, in uh, making those things happen. If you're going to compose a song, it's not something that you as an individual were able to compose. It's the spirits giving you the ideas to be able to compose the song. Though the industrial world generates wealth, it also appears cruelly wasteful to those who live in the belief that the natural world has a spiritual dimension. I see lawns in Rio Rancho and Albuquerque overflowing as if there's an abundance of water. Those are some of the reasons that the gods or the spirits that control the water can look down upon us, not only Native Americans, but people as a whole, and determine that we need to teach these people a lesson. They need to respect water. They need to pray for water. Only through that can we be assured that we'll be continually blessed by the spirits. For those who value above all the spiritual dimension, Chaco Canyon has become a special place. Maybe the person feels that they're lost in this world. If they go to Chaco with the understanding and the hopes that they can find their identity or find their direction, if they go uh, in body, spirit, uh, uh, mind, uh, and soul, they'll be able to um, to probably get that guidance without any anybody having to speak to, to that person.
Those who regard Chaco Canyon as an archaeological site of great interest still want to discover why it had roads 40 feet wide. How timber from a quarter of a million trees was hauled here by a people without horses, oxen or the wheel. They want to understand why 13 women were apparently sacrificial victims and the reason there's evidence of violence in an otherwise peaceful world. To answer such questions inevitably involves exhuming the dead and violating sites which for the Native Americans remain sacred. We will go to those locations. We ask permission to be there on site. We ask for forgiveness of those people that have gone before us and have excavated the site. Then we ask the spirits to continue to be the givers of good and to be the givers of life. This spot may have significance. It's beyond our understanding. It might have had to do with one group of people comes here and something good happens to them. And then there, th this place retains uh, a value that's beyond what it does. The value doesn't um, preserve in the dirt, you might say. We can't dig it up and say, oh, they're here because of this. The conflict between those who consider Chaco Canyon to be a fascinating archaeological site holding clues to a lost culture and those who regard it as sacred has been joined. I feel that it's disrespectful to just allow anybody to answer, enter Casa Rinconada at any time. And only in the right frame of mind are people supposed to answer. Entering a kiva is significant to journeying back to the underworld where we originated. And that in itself is an activity that we don't hold lightly. These Native Americans believed they were born deep inside the earth. In time, they came to the surface, took human form, and began a long migration southwards. Chaco Canyon and its civilization were only a stop on a much longer journey, which was halted by the arrival of Europeans. But it will be only a temporary delay. Maybe another thousand years, there isn't going to be an Albuquerque or a Rio Rancho. And at that point in time, you know, we'll be able to continue our journey. The ruins of Chaco Canyon and of all past civilizations which have faded away are testimony to the undoubted truth that no nation is immune to the forces of history and in time will face decline and fall. Tomorrow's Ancient Mysteries investigates the building of Hadrian's Wall while next on the History Channel, a portrait of U.S. diplomat and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Henry Kissinger. <laughs>